for a living that most of us do every single day. He drives a car. But it is not just any car, and he is not just any driver. He is Darrell Waltrip, who is the 1981 National Association of Stock Car Racers Driver of the Year. But the road to the top has not been as smooth as the track he races on. However, his outgoing personality has earned him almost as many fans as any of the other race car drivers on the circuit. Would you please welcome the 1981 National Association of Stock Car Racers Driver of the Year. What a title. What a guy. <laughs> Here is Darrell Waltrip. Darrell, welcome to our show. Thank you. I can make that easier for you. All uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. W would you tighten it up, please? Yeah, it's NASCAR. NASCAR. Yeah, you're the well, and you're the 1981 champ. Champion. Okay, right. fine. It's the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. Uh, stock car racing used to be a fun thing to talk about because it was always the Ford had their V8 with the most power, and then Chevrolet had one going. And when I was a kid, the Hudson Hornet was a hot car, and they were on the stock car tracks. <laughs> but but <laughs> that shows you how far back Tom goes. But now cars are basically boring. I mean, stock cars are boring. They got four cylinder engines. They have no pickup. They don't have convertibles, roadsters, hardtops. It's a single model, two door, four door hatchback. And they're boring. How do you make them exciting? I don't know, but I know Lee Iacocca would agree with you uh, <laughs> without any problem. Uh, our cars are, good Lord. <laughs> he brought a, he brought a, <laughs> the thing uh, what, took off. Is, is this your pastime, the little radio controlled miniatures? Well, you said I drive around all day. Well, I drive around all night. Wait, too. We, <laughs> haven't got, we haven't got the camera on it. We're on we're... Is that your bear? Yeah. Oh, Wait. no. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody on watching television ever saw it because the camera yeah. wasn't on it. Captain Speed crashes. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Could we get a camera on the floor, please? Thank you. Yeah, here we go. Wait a minute. Here we go. Come on, baby. Back like I said, these cars have something. no power. They're boring to drive. <laughs> do <You> something. Yeah. <laughs> Kids have a great time with these. <laughs> yeah, now run it off the end again. Crash it. I got it wide open. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man, go. <laughs> Must be a Chevy. <laughs> Uh, here we go. <laughs> it won't even do that. The stock cars that you drive are anything but stock. Now, tell me the truth. They really are. They're very sophisticated machines. Uh, the only thing about the car that's stock is, in the case of that little car sitting there, is the outside shell the body. itself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it takes about 600 man hours to build a stock car. That's uh, seven or eight guys working uh, 10 hours a day for about four weeks to build a stock car. And the car cost about $60,000 when it's completed. Mm -hmm. So uh, compared to an Indy car, those cars are very expensive. Now, if we come to see you race, you have a Buick car that you drive? Yeah, a Buick Regal, a 1981, 1982 Buick Regal. Okay, but now under the hood, there's a different kind of a motor that comes that, that, from the one that comes in the Buick Regal. Well, it's a GM engine. You know, GM went through that big hassle with a lawsuit about putting Chevrolet <laughs> yes, engine in Oldsmobiles and so on. Yeah. We run a 350 small block Chevrolet engine. The Pontiacs run them, the Chevrolets run them, the Buicks run them, everybody runs that engine. And that's a V8 engine? Yeah. It's okay. 350 cubic inches. But then some work is done to that engine to make it really go. Yeah, it's got 195 horsepower from the factory and it's got 620 when we get done. <laughs> <laughs> so you add a little goody to it there. An engine will cost uh, about $18,000 when it's completed. What is the difficult part of racing a stock car? I mean, to sit and watch it, unless there's a crash, uh, it's basically going round and round and making your move at the right time so that you're the winner of the race. Well, I, I think it's a lot like watching a, a play. Uh, the, I don't know what's wrong with that Put thing. this thing away, <laughs> you, please, before it makes us all crazy. How do you turn these things off? Um, Turn it, it's underneath there. Yeah. It's got a switch underneath. These are the ones they bring out on Christmas morning yeah. that make you crazy, you know? Uh, to get back to the question, running a, running a race is like uh, <laughs> And your... See, you didn't know Junior Johnson has one of those in the pits, and yeah. I don't do anything. <laughs> 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 to, run a ra to run a race is a lot like watching him uh, play, I think. You got the introduction where all the players are introduced, all the stars are introduced, and then the race takes off, and... Mm -hmm. The plot starts to build. There's the middle of the race where you don't know what's going on and who's going to do what. And then all of a sudden, uh, the guy that planned his strategy the best, that's what you do during a race. Uh, a lot of people think for 500 miles, you're just out there riding around. But you're... Yeah, with the radio on. Yeah. Sure. Air you conditioning know, air running. Air conditioning, yeah. the whole deal. <laughs> but in fact, you're, uh, you're planning your strategy. And it all comes down to the last few laps of the race. I was going to ask you, when, do, when is the moment of truth? But I well, have to do the commercial first, like, like a little cliffhanger. Give me time okay. to think yeah, about Exactly. It. Think it over. And uh, we'll be right back with Daryl Waltrip after this for our sponsors and the NBC television stations.
We'll get back to Daryl Waltrip in a second, but may I tell you that tomorrow night we have the Academy Award winning actress Jane Fonda on. And it's like a 500-mile fi race. You wait until you get down the last couple of laps before you make the big decision. Yeah, well, what you do is you set people up all day long. You kind of analyze the competition. Uh -huh. Uh, you try a guy at various places on the racetrack, particularly if it's somebody that you think's faster than you are. Uh, you'll say, well, I can beat him in turn three and four, but gee, he's a lot faster on the straightaways. Mm -hmm. So you analyze the competition. Hopefully, you don't have any, but l most of the time you do. What is the physical work involved here? I would think that that wheel gets pretty heavy in the hand after a couple of hundred miles and uh, going around turns. And well, I drink Mountain Dew to stay in shape. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is. It's a very strenuous sport. And a lot of people don't give uh, professional race drivers enough credit. Uh, we always get criticized for not being athletes. Tell about the, the writer. Uh, nothing irritates me any worse. And there's a few guys like this around that come up to you. They're big, heavy guys that obviously don't do anything but sit behind a typewriter and say, do you think race drivers are athletes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, this guy never, why, how, why should I answer his question? Because he obviously doesn't know what an athlete is. Those of us who are spectators often say that the reason people go to the races is they want to see a uh, crack up. Do the drivers ever have that feeling that some of the fans get a little bit bloodthirsty? I, I don't really believe that. Uh, I know there, there is a certain amount of suspense in every race. Of course. Uh, it's like watching an airplane take off. Why do people sit and watch them take off? I believe it's because they think one's going to crash sometime and they want to be there to see it. No, no, I just sit there with my little thing, you know, and how's this for radio control? Look at that sucker go. <laughs> You're sterile. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, God. I knew I shouldn't have come on this show. I'm sterile. <laughs> no, I, I think people do have that in the back of their mind, but I don't think they come for that solely for that sole purpose. Yeah, I there's a little minority of, 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 uh, of people who maybe don't have uh, all the aces in their deck who would want to see that sort of right, thing Right, and they probably carry a gun and do a lot of other weird things. Yes, you know? But yeah. for the most part, I think they come for the good, clean competition that we have. Uh, we run 31 events, as I was telling you, and we travel all over the country from Florida to California to Michigan and everywhere else. And uh, we, we put on a tremendous show. I read the other day where one of the ri uh, drivers in Formula One said that he felt that racing was becoming too much like show business. Well, I happen to believe that these folks deserve a good show. They pay $25 for a ticket. Mm -hmm. They want to see a good race, but they want to see a little showmanship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the sport needs. And they want to see some personalities. Sure. And they want to get an autograph, just like any other fan. They want to have, as you say, an entertainment in addition to a competition out there. That's exactly right. And our sport is slow to catch on to that fact, but we are catching on. Is there a conservative element in, uh, in the NASCAR uh, fraternity uh, or sorority or community that says, hey, let's not get too crazy or get too showbiz? I think there's been a problem in our sport that they don't want to get too big. You know, we've been a regional sport for the 25 or 30 years it's been in existence, solely in the South. And just now are we starting to branch out into other areas of the country. We're certainly not worldwide, but we are beginning to get national appeal. Where did stock car uh, racing start? <laughs> Was it an accidental thing that uh, happened somewhere, or did somebody organize it? What, what's the origin of stock car well, racing? Well, as the story goes, and of course it's way before my time, but uh, of course. <laughs> the moonshiners in the hills of Tennessee and Kentucky yeah. and North Carolina uh, running the rubber had fast right. cars, and the cars were, they appeared to be stock, but underneath all that stock sheet metal was a very souped up engine and a lot of uh, liquor, mm -hmm. Mountain Dew. Yes. And, uh, and uh, these cats had take off uh, down the road, and somebody named Bill France, Bill France Sr., decided that uh, these guys have got these fast cars when they're not using them for, to run moonshine in, why don't we put them out on a racetrack? Uh -huh. So he organized NASCAR, the National Association for Stock Car Racing took the moonshiners and kind of dressed them up a little bit, put numbers on the side of their cars, and started putting and the them rest, on the racetrack. And the rest is history. And the rest is history. Now, I rest my case. What, what is the number on the side of your car? Number 11. All right, now when you get out of old number 11, after a race in which you've attained speeds of about 200 miles per hour, and you saunter down uh, the freeway or Main Street or whatever, how difficult is it to resist the temptation to put her to the floor and let her rip? Well, I tell you, Tom, I don't have that temptation at all. It's very relaxing to get out of a noisy 600 horsepower race car and sit down in a nice, quiet, air-conditioned luxury car, turn on the stereo and ride along about 45 or 50. Really and truly. I really enjoy that. You, uh, you don't feel the urge on the highway, for example, to pass a car just for the sheer joy of passing a car? Not anymore. I, I, I have a policy. I only race when I get paid. Uh -huh. <laughs> as, a, uh, as a teenager, were you a fast driver? 
terribly bad driver as a teenager. I, I learned my lesson well. <laughs> I used to get in a lot of trouble when I was a kid, but... Uh, like? Uh, just driving too fast, yeah. racing on the streets, which I'm not an advocate of. And a matter of fact, I'm going to do a thing for the state of Tennessee in a few weeks about safe driving on the streets. Tennessee has a bad record, and we're going to try to clean it up a little bit. Okay. Now, your season is 10 months long. You just finished up in Riverside, California. Now you have to, what, time off for the holidays? Yeah, we're going to be off until February the 7th is the Bush Clash, which is a 20-lap uh, race at Daytona that pays the winner about $50,000, which I won this past year. And uh, then February the 14th is the Daytona 500, which will be our initial That's a major event. As yeah, I told you, when I lived is. in Savannah, Georgia, I went to that race one time, and that's a hell of a show down It there. is. Fact, It'll be nationally televised, and it's a big deal. In fact, as I recall, it's an entire weekend of show. There it's is a, a lot going on there besides week. the race. Yes, Speed week, they it's, call it. It's life in the fast lane, as they say. Good luck in the season of 1982. Congratulations on your championship with NASCAR in 1981. Happy holidays, and thank you for being with us thank tonight. You. It's my, my pleasure. pleasure. Mr. Darrell Waltrip. We will continue with more of Earl Kluge right after these announcements. Thank you, Darrell.